Hi, everybody. My name is Chloe Cole. Many of you parents and families here today know just how impressionable and subject to change that children and teenagers are. Sometimes children say things that they don't mean or fully understand, perhaps because they're following their peers and taking influence from them and their environments, or because they simply are learning to communicate their feelings and be a part of the world around them. And throughout all the highs and lows of childhood, you've seen firsthand how every single experience from scraped knees to starting puberty and your love and discipline through it all is shaping them into who they are or will be as an adult. And frankly, none of these experiences can or even should be opted out of, no matter how difficult. Yet, there are adults out there who want to take it all away from children. They want to strip them of their innocence and put them in charge of themselves. Some make the claim that children are hardly any different from adults, that they too are sexual beings, and that everybody has an innate understanding of their identity. They believe that a child's narrow, developing view of the world should take precedence over the judgment of those who know them best, their parents, their, care their caretakers, and their families. There is a movement of immature, power-hungry adults who want to rid the world of all good and all structure, threatening to rip children from their loving families and place them into the clutches of a tyrannical government and those who blindly abide to it. When I was a kid, I struggled great with my, with my identity and the fact that I would one day grow from a girl into a woman. As a tomboy, I often felt that I was out of place amongst other girls, even down to the way that I looked. I started puberty fairly early. I was about nine years old and I was just going to my, my fourth grade year when I started to visibly develop breasts. And the newfound attention that this gave me was incredibly uncomfortable and difficult for me to adjust to at such a young age. And I would constantly compare myself to other women. I felt like I would never be curvy or beautiful or feminine enough to ever be a proper woman. I didn't ask to bleed out of my body every month for half my life, and I feared the responsibility of pregnancy and motherhood. I felt in a lot of ways that life would be better if I were a boy, and sometimes I even questioned why I was born this way. Though it weighed on my heart and mind heavily, none of these feelings were really out of the ordinary for a girl my age, and with time and care, I likely would have come to accept and embrace womanhood. But we'll never know for sure, because I wasn't given that chance. When I told mom and dad that I was a boy and that I wanted to be their son and not their daughter, they were rightfully cautious. On one hand, they saw that I was trying to establish my identity and role in the world, and they wanted to be supportive of me throughout it. But on the other hand, they were concerned as to where this was coming from, as they hadn't heard anything like this from any of my older siblings. This was completely new to them, though they immediately made the connection that this related to the personal struggles that I had while growing up. They thought that the best thing to do was to seek the help of mental health professionals who they expected to not only help me, but also them as my parents. My psychologists and physicians, however, they never questioned this identity that I took on or why I so badly wanted to reject my birth sex. Not that they could. In my home state of California, if a doctor does not strictly, does not strictly to adhere to the affirmative care model, meaning that they don't mindlessly affirm my perceived identity as a boy, they could lose their license by not mindlessly affirming their identity under the guise of conversion therapy. The one doctor I had who refused to give me a prescription is inexplicably no longer with my healthcare provider. As soon as my first appointment, my doctor started with the immediate affirma affirmation of my preferred name and pronouns, and I was unquestioningly led towards medicalization just a few months in. They demanded my parents to do the very same, and they gave them the harsh ultimatum of either having a dead daughter or a living transgender son. As a parent, what wouldn't you do if you were faced with the death of your child by her doctors? The very first intervention I was given was 
of course, puberty blockers, also known as Lupron, which is a drug that was previously used to either treat advanced testicular cancer or for chemical castration of sex offenders. My first shot of cross-sex hormones followed just a month or two afterward. I was only halfway through my eighth grade year, and yet I was being enabled to make permanent decisions that would impede my natural development from there on. I wanted so badly just to be a real boy, though I didn't know what this meant or what life really even was like as a boy. But the transgender community mon mantra of trans women are women and trans men are men. And the fallacious ideas of gender dysphoria having a physical marker in the body and girls having boys' brains and vice versa deceived me as an impressionable, de as an impressionable tween. As my transition advanced, I still understood at the very least that this idea of gender was still rooted in sex and biological characteristics. And for this reason, my breasts were becoming more and more uncomfortable to even acknowledge after having been sexually assaulted by a boy in eighth grade. I wanted my breasts to be gone, and I wanted to even forget that they were ever there. When I was 15, the summer right before my junior year of high school, I underwent a double mastectomy, and my breasts were surgically removed. It's been about three years, and I still haven't fully healed. The healing process is still ongoing. I still have to wear bandages on my chest every day because a couple years post-op, the skin grafts that they made out of my areolas began to weep fluid and bleed every day. And I've gotten absolutely no help from the surgeon who did this to me. The mastectomy was a major shock in every single way to my body, to my mind, to my heart. Even though now I had a deep voice and I was perceptibly male looking and everybody in my life knew me as a boy, as their son, as their brother, as their friend, Leo. The further that I went into transition, the more I understood that I couldn't change the way that I was born. And no boy ever has to go through this to become a man. I soon discovered that it was all a lie and an attempt to run away from reality. That one day I wanted to be a mother and have children of my own. And in order to do that, I would have to live as a woman. I couldn't bear to live so miserably anymore. I decided that I would never pick up a single vial of testosterone ever again. I would never take that injection ever again. <laughs> but words couldn't capture the amount of guilt that I felt for my family and everybody around me, especially mom and dad. And I felt as though I was nothing more than just wasted time and money for them. But their unwavering love and support for me in spite of these feelings that I had helped me to understand that I was worthy. And it gave me hope that one day I could move on from this and live happily. After six months, um, after um, about six months after turning 17, I took it upon myself to begin speaking out, and uh, I first directed my efforts towards Louisiana, where there were attempts to prohibit non-gender affirmative talk therapy under the label of conversion therapy. A similar effort, I believe, was being made in Ohio, but it failed in favor of the recent passing of the SAFE Act. I was pretty undeniably nervous, but I, I went through it. I, I went through with it. I, I shared my personal story, and it's been pretty instrumental in changing the entire discourse in the US. And the result has been pretty dramatic. Um, a few weeks ago, Louisiana reversed its position entirely, and it became the last southern state to make gender transition in minors illegal.
And these victories have been moving into the Midwest. Ohio and Missouri are currently leading the Midwest away from gender ideology. Thank you so much, Ohio. The victories that we've achieved in the last legislative session are pretty monumental. Successes have been seen in Louisiana, Texas, Utah, Idaho, South Dakota, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Indiana, Ohio, Tennessee, Missouri, Kentucky, and last but not least, Florida. In each of these states, I testified and collaborated with lawmakers and our efforts are guard guarding children from this medical experimentation and I've transcended my status as a victim. But there's still a lot of work to be done, especially here in Ohio. Let the state be an example for Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, and the rest of the country that is still grappled by the pseudoscience. <laughs> Children are relying on us as parents, older brothers and sisters, educators, doctors, as adults to guide them towards a healthy adulthood filled with opportunity. I hear a lot of talk in the state about issue one and reproductive freedom, but that seems to end when we start talking about the fact that children are having their right to reproduce, taken away from them with sterilizing drugs that are used to convert healthy girls and boys into just a mimicry of the opposite sex. Where are their reproductive rights? Mine were lost when I was 13. You and I are the only thing standing in between this attack on children. You have a duty to finish this fight with me. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Don't go anywhere yet. Don't go anywhere. I wanted Chloe just to make an apology. We are Christians. We are Americans. And I want to apologize to you on behalf of every single Christian who has not stood up for you and has allowed this to happen. This stops. This stops Tuesday, because we are giving the rights of parents back to them so that beautiful warriors like this will not be scarred. But by your stripes, you have been healed. By the Lord's stripes, we've been healed. That is the first thing. We need to be cold and courageous about that. Because, guys, people, Issue one is about two, okay, yes, it's a 60-40 com, uh, constitutional change, but what they have baked in, if they're not, we're not able to have more safe space or, or with the Constitution, the agenda is endless. Secretary of State Mark Frank LaRose said that. They have a lot on the docket. The first two things are in the November election. They're going after kids. See, we're blessed because we have Chloe as a speaker here. Okay, what they did, the first victim group they're going after is the babies. And when they're killed in the womb, they don't have a voice. But now we do. Now, last thing before I let you go, because I know you've been on a, you want to go. So we would like to offer a special prayer over you. Because you mentioned that you have some serious wounds and you shared with those and bodily, spiritual, all of that. But we, are, we believe that where two or three are gathered in the name of the Lord Jesus, there he is in our midst. And he's here because we have 2,000 out there or more. We have thousands watching across the country. We're united here. 
under this flag and under this God. So I would like to invite a special man. We'll give him a proper introduction later. But from the moment, Bishop Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas. And we're going to say a prayer over Chloe. And I want you, if you want, if you extend your hands or whatever you feel comfortable with, but the, there is power in prayer. This is our moment. Let's pray for this warrior. Almighty God, we thank you for your beautiful daughter, Chloe, for her strength, her feminine courage, her willingness to speak out for the many Chloe's out there. We give you thanks, Lord, for your daughter who has become an example that we must seek and live your will. We pray that she is healed in body, mind, and spirit by all the love that surrounds her now and by the wonder of your love that is with her always. And for the many young people at this very moment confused about who they are. May Chloe's voice help them to know that they are your children, that they are beloved as they are, and that they can continue to grow and develop, seeking your will, your light and grace. Almighty God, in your Son and Spirit, we ask your blessing for Chloe, that she is strengthened, that she knows how many are touched and helped by her willingness to speak out, and that she is guided always in your loving spirit with the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary for her life. And we ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 